exciting ideas. Uh, today is very special. My friend uh, Zach is here, uh, who's a very good friend, and I, I'm used to talking to him a lot. And so we're doing an experiment. He's doing a podcast, and he'll tell a little bit about his podcast. Uh, Zach, can you tell me what your podcasts are about? Sure. So it's called Unpacking Ideas. Uh, each episode, I have a different guest on to unpack a different piece of writing. So most of them are essays. I'm trying to speak or stick to kind of like classic ex essays. We've done Emerson, Montaigne, uh, Thoreau, and yeah, that's kind of it, it in a nutshell. So today what we are going to do is that we are going to look at Ascent of Man. We've been studying Ascent of Man. And my absolute favorite episode is The Longest Childhood. And what I keep feeling whenever we are doing these meetups is that I'm not, we are not doing justice to this. This is such good stuff. And so this is like my one more, and I, I cheated by starting the entire series with the last episode, 13th episode, because I always like to know where this, you know, where this ball is going to end. Um, so, and it is the most profound of the episodes. So what the format for today's meetup is that we are going to start with doing the podcast, me and Zach doing the podcast on his podcast, okay? It's going to be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. The best way you can get maximum value out of this meetup is that keep detailed notes of what you're getting from it because we're trying to cover We've had long conversations about this episode. We have watched it multiple times and we are trying to hit the key ideas of Brunowski. So keep track of ideas and questions that you have. And once we are done with this presentation, look at the presentation or the podcast as simply putting thoughts on your table. You have to organize it and then we'll have plenty of time to go back and forth. I want to hear what you got from it. Uh, I want to respond to it. Um, we want to go back and forth with everybody. Okay. But first part about one hour, one or 15 minutes is going to be just me and Zach on his podcast, followed by this free for all, not really free for all. We never do that, but um, just very highly interactive uh, conversation. And please do keep notes of questions that you have, comments that you have. You'll have plenty of opportunities to express yourself and uh, ask questions and make comments. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand the baton over to Zach. Zach, you're on. Awesome. Cool. I'm excited to do this. We've uh, I've been wanting to have you on for a while. And uh, I know you're a busy guy. And uh, I'm glad we were able to kind of you know, have it on your platform as well. So this is going to be awesome. Um, so I talked to you, I think, two weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago, and was asking kind of what you've been interested in, in what you've been reading. And you were raving about this series. And this uh, documentary series, you said it's the best documentary series ever. And you know, I've known you for a long time, took your word for it. And uh, I've binge watched the whole the whole 13 episodes in the last two weeks. Wow. And you told me not to, you, you said, uh, <laughs> you said it's going to be too much and your head's going to explode, but, uh, I did it anyways. I, uh, I ate from the tree of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've actually kind of been on vacation here I'm visiting my family. So I had some time and I've been, you know, visiting with them as well, I've, but you know, watching the documentary series as well. And you're right. It's incredible. Um, I, it was not on my radar before, so this is uh, Jacob Bronofsky, uh, 1973, I believe, BBC series. And today, we're going to focus on the final episode, which is called The Long Childhood. And this is where he summarizes a lot of his ideas. I mean, the entire series, he looks at the... Um, you know, it's called the ascent of man. So he's, he's really trying to ask the question, why, why man, why humans? And, you know, in that you get what, what distinguishes humans from the other animals. Uh, and then he, you know, specifically looks at science and, you know, the, the, um, some of the major breakthroughs in science, but 
maybe we can just start with this question. So he spends a lot of time talking about man as distinguished from other animals. And the way he, he phrases it uh, as only he could, he says, what makes man what he is? And, you know, he's, the premise here is that there is something special. There's something unique about man from all the other animals. You know, he gives some of the examples. Uh, I think in this episode, he says, uh, it's the human creature who rides the horse and not the other way around. Um, you know, there must be something unique about man, evidently, because otherwise the ducks would be lecturing about Lorenz and the rats would be writing papers about B.F. Skinner. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of his funny way of, of saying it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of our, our starting point. And one more thing before we get into it. Um, you know, this is a pretty, this is a pretty core question, you know, that I, a lot of thinkers have spent a lot of time on. And w- he attacks this from mo- many different ways. And in the first episode, he says, uh, the physical differences are secondary. So when we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, and we'll get into it later that it's, it's mostly that, you know, our brain is, is unique and, um, but I was thinking maybe to start off, we can start with some of these uh, physical differences uh, between humans and, and other animals, because I think they're definitely worth kind of hitting on. Is that wonderful, sense? wonderful. Okay. Uh, so, Zach, I'm very excited about, uh, you know, being part of your uh, podcast. And this is like the perfect topic because mm. it is so rich. Um, and I'm delighted that you ended up binge watching all the 13 episodes <laughs> if you have to do binge watching on something this is a good thing to binge watch yes um all right um so what sets man apart i think mm-hmm. the best way to look at it is through the evolutionary um cycle okay firstly i want to say that my ability to deal with Bronowski's material is not very good okay because this is very very deep stuff mm. and i think i have some ability uh but not not good okay so i'm going to try my best okay but there is so much, there is so much here. And so it's so deep. Absolutely. So I think the way in which I would start is to yep. look at, you know, the transition of man mm-hmm. from being on all fours to standing upright, because yep. what standing upright does in one stroke, it increases the visual field instead mm-hmm. of being at this low level in the middle of grass where you can't, can hardly see anything. You're now, way up there and you can see things at a distance okay Mm. secondly it frees up your hands yeah so you are able to do things with it and we have Mm. these opposable thumbs which allows for precision combination of the visual impact i mean the first result of that is that brain starts to grow because so much data so much more data is coming in Mm -hmm. and we are able to do so much with it yeah that loop, the control mechanism for that loop, which is the brain, starts to grow in order to make the most of it. So that's like, that's a giant step forward. Um, hand, he, he, he talks about hand, my yeah. friend Joya, uh, you know, calls, I think one of the episodes, I think it's episode second, two, uh, the ode to the hand. Mm. Um, because what the hand does I mean, and the way in which he puts the hand is that there is this loop between the hand and the brain. That hand is the cutting edge of the brain. Mm -hmm. He's very much, he sees human beings as as a living being, and he's seeing all of cogitation as a way of living, of transforming the world. Uh, So that that loop is something that he focuses on. Go ahead. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, our, our hands are the primary way that we manipulate the world. And, you know, Bronofsky makes the point that we're not the only species with opposable thumbs, but we are the only species that can link the thumb to the forefinger. And this is a very powerful, uh, uh, a be- very powerful combination. You know, it allows us to use and manipulate tools in certain ways. And, you know, something I think about is like, you can imagine you can imagine a creature with the intellect of a human that doesn't have any hands and they're very limited even something like a dolphin i mean obviously a dolphin 
is intelligent. Not I'm not saying a dolphin is as intelligent as a human, but they have flippers. They're very limited. Um, so I, I think that's a really big uh, a really big point. And he he says one of the ways that maybe this has been symbolically represented uh, throughout time has been in the symbol of the Buddha. And there's the kind of the the Buddha. Uh, you know, I know people listening to this can't see, but he's kind of holding up like a Diana Ross stop in the name of love. Uh, <laughs> to use a, <laughs> an example, that, that's but, a great image. <laughs> Buddha and <laughs> yeah, but and he's in Bernofsky says the Buddha is giving a, the hand, which is the gift of humanity, um, which I, I thought was really cool. Um, a really cool, uh, you know, kind of symbolic metaphor for so the hand, importance of the hand. So I think upright posture, then hand. Mm -hmm. And then the big thing that he focuses on is foresight, that an animal is focused on the immediate surrounding, the here mm -hmm. and now, and the thing that characterizes human beings is to operate at a distance and operate at a different time. So you can see it initially just by hunting, you know, looking mm -hmm. at the context of hunting where you're able to see both kind of the, the predator coming at a distance so you can respond to it, plan for it, or you can see a prey at a distance and you can go ahead and coordinate uh, from, from that. But mostly it is about time of being able to see, think about in the future of what would happen and mm. consider the possibilities. So that ability of, you know, imagination of possibilities and foresight of looking across time um, is, I really is, like that. Mm -hmm. I hadn't, I hadn't made that connection, but I, I like, you know, cause you're kind of saying it's, it's our physical ability to, to see further and to, to see above, um, you know, the horizon. And there's a link there between, you know, the parts of our brain that start to develop, which allow us to, you know, plan into the future and that those things are, are correlated. Exactly. And that it's, it's the starting point. It's the starting point. And then you know, man takes those faculties that were developed in that context and uses his imagination to use them in a way which is completely on a different orders of magnitude mm. uh, than was possible in the physical context. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe the third one, since we're kind of talking about some of the... Um, you know, the benefits of humans starting to walk upright. Um, another one, it wasn't in here, but it, it made me think of it. I know Jared Diamond talks about um, when we started walking upright, it allowed the vocal cords to expand. And, you know, that's another thing. Uh, we're just talking about physical differences between humans. Obviously, other animals can make sounds, but our ability to make a wide range of sounds and to manipulate sound um, you know, is one of the reasons that we're able to communicate uh, at such a high level. So I think vocal cords is another uh, pretty damn good benefit Absolutely. to walking upright. Absolutely. And what vocal cords make possible, speech, and then using speech to coordinate actions socially. Mm. So there is coordination amongst primates. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, chimpanzees can hunt and they can hunt pretty well. But what speech does is that it increases both kind of precision and complexity of what can be communicated. Yeah. Um, so addition of speech as a social tool mm. makes possible um, transmission of whatever discovery individuals make mm -hmm. and making them standard part, standard issue of everybody in the group. And thus you build on that. Uh, so I think, I think speech is, is huge. Yeah, it's huge. And, and we'll kind of probably get into um, some of the other benefits, you know, uh, speech and language are just part of our ability to communicate ideas and knowledge that has been gained through generation to generation and pass it down to the children. Um, I want to hit but, one last point. Yeah, yeah. 
before, before we move, move on. on. And yeah. that's tools. Oh, you know, tools. Yeah. Making, tool making. Because tool making is like extension of the hand. I always think of it as mm. extension of the hand. So you are using your hand to create something outside of yourself that you are going to now use. You're going to develop procedures for using it. And that is again passed as part of the culture to leverage the ability of the group as a mm. whole, as well as individuals. So tool making, I think, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who called man tool making animals. I think that is profoundly true. Yeah, I like that as well. And tool making as opposed to tool using. Because again, that's another one of the um, you know, I think it was uh Jane Goodall who kind of busted the myth that humans are the only animals to use tools, but um, you know, we have like chimpanzees will use like a stick to fish out um termites and like a log or something. But they're not really they're not really creating tools. They're not really crafting tools, maybe exactly. in, in the way that that humans do. Um, well, cool. So maybe we can move on to talking about the long childhood. Wonderful. So this is the core of what this episode is about. Um, so, all right. He says humans are neotenous. And this was a new word for me. He says neotenous means we come from the womb still as embryos. And this is a huge idea. I mean, he, he makes the idea that, you know, a lot of other species of animals, when they come out of the womb, they're more or less developed. They're more or less where they're going to be. I mean, a snake from day one is self-sufficient. Their mother, you know, I don't even think he even sees them. They're just like on their own, ready to go. Other animals, you know, maybe take a couple of months of, of uh, parental investment, you know, some other animals, a couple of years. And then you look at humans and, you know, humans, probably the first 13, 14 years of life, uh, they need adults to not die. And, you know, some people would even say uh, nowadays, maybe uh, somebody needs an adult till they're in their 50s or something. But um, so the question is why? This is obviously a huge, it's a huge kind of parental investment. It's a liability. And... Um, so yeah, maybe we can use that as our jumping off point. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's fantastic. It's, it's a major investment and there has to be a reason yeah. why right. uh, that is worth it. Um, and essentially what happens is that human beings are born with only half their brain formed mm. and rest of the, you know, half of the brain development takes place outside while interacting with other human beings and the surroundings. So that plasticity of adaptability gets built in. So for example, as you were pointing out, snake, when it is born, it is carbon copy of its parents. It's able to do everything that the parent does. Yeah. And that's fantastic because there is no, it is ready to go right off the bat. Yeah. But that means and, and it means that if the environment is the same, that snake's ability is going to be fantastic. It's the very effective way. But if the environment is different, then it's not going to be able to adapt to that. So it's right. hard-coded. Whereas the child learns from the parents, the culture. Mm. So it while the brain is forming, so it level it adds a level of plasticity to human beings um, on a tremendous scale. And it's a scale. So this is essentially the mammalian path where the childhood of a more advanced mammal is longer in proportion yeah. to their, their, their lifespan. Yeah. Well, and just, yeah, you mentioned plasticity. I mean, that's, that's the huge I think that's the big point that he brings up throughout this whole episode is, you know, it's our ability to adapt to the environment, adapt to the culture, and to even change the culture to fit our needs. He makes a point, I don't know if it's in this episode or another one, that uh, basically like other animals adapt to fit their environment, 
humans change our environment to fit us. So it's, you know, it's also, I think our ability to adapt also allows us to do that. Now, that's a great point. And we should have made that point, you know, when you say, what is it that is unique about human beings? Mm. If you want to really summarize what is you about unique about human beings is that we transform our environment. Yeah. We, instead of um, adapting to the environment, we are able to transform the environment. Um, and that's really the hallmark of, of human beings. Yeah. And with me, one more point, um, while we're kind of talking about the plasticity, um, he, at one point in the, the documentary, he, he pulls a, uh, a skull from a, I can never pronounce, Othropolithicus. I think I'm butchering that, but he, he pulls up the skull, you know, from one of our ancient, ancient ancestors. And he says, what makes this, uh, what makes their brain different from ours? And he says, you know, if we think about the brain as a computer, it's not just that our brains are a more advanced computer than their brain. Like he, he's like, yes, it, you know, it is, you know, it, it is a more kind of advanced computer, but it's a different kind of machine. And maybe a computer is not a good analogy. Uh, he says, quote, if the brain were a computer, then it would be carrying out a pre-wired set of actions in an inflexible sequence. And then he says, if we are any kind of machine, then we are a learning machine. So, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a big point. Um, cool. And cool. So we talked a little bit about plasticity. I want to um, hit and, one more oh, yeah, point please. about the long childhood. Yeah. Children are characterized by curiosity mm. of openness to the world of interest in the world, of fascination with the world. And what he's pointing out is that that capacity in human beings is the heart of who we are. Mm. Asking questions and relentlessly asking questions, um, open-ended questions. I mean, it's very different from the snake example that we're talking about, where it's all about there is no curiosity there at all. There is just, so, so uh, curiosity being kind of the hallmark of children and curiosity being hallmark of man as such. Yeah, and it's also maybe the hallmark of science. Yes. Because science, and, and he kind of alludes to this point that science and children are similar. Mm -hmm. And that a child is constantly asking why a child is constantly questioning. And, um, you know, he, he also makes the point, uh, let's see if I can pull up the exact quote. He says, our scientific civilization adores above all else, the symbol of the child. And he gives some examples of, uh, he says, ever since the Renaissance, I should add. And he gives the example of the Christ child painted by Raphael and the, you know, the children at Gauss and uh, Dickens portray. So, you know, in our kind of 21st century scientific civilization, um, he, I guess he sees that he sees the emphasis that our civilization, he sees our, excuse me, he sees our civilization um, valuing the child. Um, and maybe even above the adult, which I, I think that's, it's an, it's an interesting point. It has a lot of implications, you know, maybe why we, uh, value youth so much in our culture and day and age where maybe some traditional cultures, and we'll get into a little bit, he talks about static cultures. We'll get into that in a little later. Um, but a lot of these more traditional cultures, there's a lot more kind of respect and reverence for the elders and the tradition that we may be black, at least, I don't know. I, I think that's a safe thing to say that. Um, so I don't know. I, I guess I had never made that connection in that, um, you know, it is the same curiosity and questioning and uh, reverence for the child that maybe 
distinguishes our culture from from others. No, I, absolutely, absolutely. And he makes that point when he starts to compare. Mm. Um, you know, look at these traditional cultures. Yeah. Um, you know, with with Easter Island. Yeah. Maybe that's a good transition to yes. get into um, talking about static cultures. So, so yeah, so he says, you know, though our culture values the child, uh, he says that's, he says that's not the only way that cultures tend, tend to tend to be. He says we, we have examples of what he calls static cultures. So, um, Let's see. He says, for most of history, children have been asked simply to conform to the image of the adult. And uh, he sees static cultures as being, um, like he says, a lot of times nomadic cultures are static cultures. And, and I think he says it's because they, they basically don't have time for innovation. They're always on the run. They're always on the move. And what is most effective is for the children to emulate the adults and you know he says like in these cultures you even look at the little kids and they're basically just trying to emulate their parents and become them and the culture uh kind of praises that and so that, i mean that was kind of the point i was making before maybe that's why in those cultures there's such kind of reverence and respect for the elders um it is interesting you know he he's starts by showing us the statues of Easter Island, mm. these expressionless faces. And the child, this alive face, is trying to emulate, to become that. Mm. So it's, it's actually, a, uh, it's like, it's a reversal of m mammalian sequence of instead of being, kind of having longer and longer childhood, you're holding, you're holding up for the child the ideal of being like a little snake. You know, <laughs> no, 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 you're not a mammal. Please be a snake. You know, be exact <laughs> carbon copy of your parents. Mm. So this entire mammalian, it's like erasing that part of, yeah. of evolution and going back to a much more primitive uh, way of operation. Yeah. Well, and he says, when you look at some of these, uh, a lot of these thinkers who draw up these utopias, you get people like Plato and his Republic and Sir Thomas More, like the utopias that they imagine are always static cultures. You know, they kind of imagine, okay, if I create this, you know, amazing uh, society that it can just stay static and be the same and it will always work for humans. And I think what Bernowski's saying is that's that's like a deadly flaw to make. It is because you're not taking into account the uh, you know what man is, and man is plastic, as we as you said earlier. And and there's there's always going to be an element of change. So I think what he's saying is anytime we get these uh, you know kind of dogmatic ideas about this is the way it will be for all time it's bound to fail and you know he brought up easter island he says we look at these statues now and they look crude and you know archaic to our eyes and you know we kind of look back like how could they have thought that this would you know be the the um you know ideal that humans should live up to until the end of time because if we know one thing about humans is that they're they're always changing Right. I mean, this idea of static, I, mean, I want to bring the parallels between three things. Mm -hmm. So all these utopias, which people think are like the height of intellectualism, mm -hmm. whether it is Plato, whether it is uh, Thomas More, this whole bunch of other ones, uh, including the concept of heaven, for example, which is kind of static. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That is similar to traditional cultures like a nomad mm -hmm. and that is similar to a snake or to to basically to a very primitive way of being mm -hmm. as and that is being held as an ideal in very sophisticated they, i mean snakes is actual biology 
the kind of nomadic cultures is that in a human, but fairly, you know, in the oral culture. And then you have things like Plato at a, in a written culture, mm. using all these words, but trying to do the same thing, trying to go back to, to that. And the contrast to that is the child, is the active process of concept of growth, concept of continuously facing challenges and overcoming the challenges and going to the next level and facing more challenges as mm. a result of that, which is a very different mindset. So I see it as being static yeah. versus dynamic, you know, static, like almost like a stone mm -hmm. versus this living system, which is dynamic with a feedback, continuous feedback, where no matter what you come up with your in your head or with your hands, you do not regard them as the final, but only as a stepping stone to go to the next level. Yeah, no, I love that. Well, and he gives, you know, he gives plenty of examples of uh, static cultures. And I should, should mention, he doesn't just say that these nomadic cultures tend to be static. He also gives the example of like Egypt and Assyria and China and uh, Europe in the Middle Ages. So he says, you know, even like Western civilization, we've, there have been instances where the, you know, at some point the, the culture kind of became static. And I think what he's implying there is that's why these, uh, you know, that's why they've failed. And, you know, that's why they've, uh, we've had, you know, the end of these cultures. And one other, th other thing I was thinking, maybe the more dynamic culture, you know, the culture who is open to changing and adapting, I don't know, would you say something like, uh, like the constitution and the amendments are something that's more in alignment with that, where it's, at least in theory, it's, it's basically saying, we know that things are going to continue to change. And so we need to build into the system something that allows for that to happen. Absolutely. Uh, Zach, this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic point. Mm. Um, and I don't think I get it well. Okay. Because yeah. it's a very deep point. Because on one hand, it is really a point of epistemology. This is the mm -hmm. heart of science. where you're yeah. focused on asking questions. A scientist wants to ask questions. Once they have figured something out, they will start asking new questions. Mm -hmm. So there is always this, it's the epistemology of saying that I'm not going to just hold on to the answers, mm -hmm. that I'm going to keep asking questions. So that's one part of it, that there is a sense of growth to it. So first, let's look at it just at the epistemological level. Yeah. Okay, and then let's look at it at kind of political economic level. Okay, again, I my my knowledge is very very poor here. Okay, so I'm just <laughs> I'm just ad libbing here. Okay, so what happens? So one part of science. Okay, the second part of it is the objectiveness of it, that a scientist will write things down. This is what I think. This is why I think it, and mm -hmm. other people can look at it and critique it. And that is considered good. And yeah. if the scientists found that they were wrong, they will say, thank you. Thank right. you for correcting it. So there is, this is what royal society is about. And this is like, this is like the enlightenment culture, okay? Mm. In terms of the technology, it's the print technology, which makes it at a completely different level of scale. So people can independently look at things and then talk to each other, make arguments, learn from each other, and that is considered good. Mm. Contrast that to Egypt, where all the knowledge is hierarchical. Yeah. There is a priest king at the top who controls mm -hmm. both kind of the spiritual dimension and the physical dimension. Right. So there is an element of freedom of thought that is there. So at the epistemological level, it's something very different. And you can see it happening in, 
in uh, enlightenment. You can mm -hmm. see the harbingers of it in Renaissance of people doing it at an artistic level. And then you see the fullest uh, explication of it in conceptual explicit terms in, in uh, enlightenment. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you're like, you're making these transitions super easy for me because that really transitions into, you know, next thing we're going to talk about is democracy of the intellect. And, you know, you made the point, um, you know, in some of these traditional cultures or, you know, even in places like Egypt or, you know, in the Middle Ages where only a handful of people had access to the information and there was a certain kind of uh, hierarchy. And he calls this, uh, a minority culture. He says a minority culture is where only a tiny fraction of all the talent that mankind produces is actually used, uh, learns to read, learns to write, learns another language. And one of the things uh, he points to that changed this, uh, at least in, um, in Europe, was the printing press. And this, of course, allowed uh, access to, you know, uh, a lot more people. And there was no long, there were no longer these uh, kind of gatekeepers of knowledge and information. Whereas, you know, before maybe you had to be a monk if you wanted to have access to the books or have access to the library. You know, now we have uh, the printing press, which makes all this information a lot more available, um, leading to, you know, the demo democracy of the intellect. And, um, you know, and we could, you know, th this documentary was made before the internet, but we could, you know, carry that forward and say the internet just, uh, you know, it took that to the next level as far as making information available. Absolutely. And I want to um, pick up on, what you started this mm. segment with about the uh, the constitution. Um, so let's look at it at a political level. Um, what is different with in the conception of individuals in the Declaration of Independence as compared to Egypt? Egypt says that it's the top-down structure and individual is a little cog in this mm -hmm. entire machine. Whereas Jefferson starts by saying that the prime movers are these individuals and what is sacred is their own pursuit of their life, mm. liberty and pursuit of happiness. And in order to protect that, you create governments. So the direction is exactly opposite. Yeah. So it is the freedom of action, freedom of exploration, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to shape your own life and pursue your own happiness. That at an at a individual level. And so it's at all these different particles, all these many particles. Mm. That's what the goal is. Okay, so let's just look at the goal. That is dramatically different from that Easter Island. We're saying mm -hmm. goal is to become that. Yeah. You know, of a, a limited thing. And that's if you aspire and if you do very well, you will become that. And that is the ceiling. Whereas this is like, this is like, these are like children trying to grow. Right. So it is at, at, a, at the kind of a metaphysical level, it's a different conception. Of, of man and society. No, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, um, if there's, is there anything else you wanted to touch on in as far yes, as democracy? Yes, then it's like, yes, oh, please, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to, I want to connect the point about the democracy. Mm. So just like in science, okay, and this is actually far more. You can easily, far easily see this in the constitution. So, so okay, you have these individual people, right? Lots of individual people. So how do you build a structure that allows people to actually flourish? Mm. And the idea of founding fathers is that you have this system of checks and balances where there are many, many parts that balance 
each other and you have to negotiate, you have to make compromises for things to happen. It is like, right. um, there is an amazing book that I've just come, come across. It's called Constitution of Knowledge. Okay. I forget the name of the author. Um, if somebody can put it in the chat, that will be great. Um, what he says is that the way in which founding fathers structured the constitution and the way in which the democracy of intellect works or kind of the scientific community or royal society works is similar where everybody can say their piece or is free to say their piece. There is a freedom of expression and there are these systems that are built in order to evaluate things and things that pass certain evaluations, certain kind of commonality, go to the next level and become more influential. So there is a negotiation going on. Instead of ideas going top down, yeah. they kind of bubble up, bottom up. Kind of would it, like a meritocracy be the right word or yes, but it's it's dynamic in the sense mm -hmm. that it is negotiated all the time. Okay. And there are areas where somebody is going to be better, where they, they flourish more, they, they do things more, they control things more. And if they start failing, there, is, there are other forces. So it's a dynamic system of checks and balances, which keep correcting things, just like it does in scientific papers, like mm -hmm. scientific community, yeah. the same thing happening at, at a political level. Yeah, no, and I, I love that whole the the connection of kind of uh, science, you know, the way that science works, uh, kind of mapping that onto, um, you know, how a government should should essentially work. Um, I think that's a really big big idea, and that like, yeah, sci I mean, a, a a good scientist is always willing to want to hear when they're wrong <laughs> they're one they're one you know like you said it's it's peer reviewed they're constantly being uh critiqued and you know having their experiments replicated and having that feedback happening um so yeah and, and i think that's maybe you know one of the points he's making about uh government and uh that when that doesn't happen that's when uh culture tends to stagnate and turn into dogma, turn into, you know, and he talks about, uh, and I think two episodes before this, um, you know, a lot of what happened with in World War II and the concentration camps, I think he, he made some point there that like, uh, he's at the very end, he's like in Auschwitz, and he's saying, this is what happens when we claim to have absolute knowledge and absolute certainty. Um, so yeah, I mean, he makes the, po the point pretty, pretty uh, profoundly there. Excellent. Cool. Cool. You cool to, to move on to talking about social solitary? Yes. All right. Beautiful. So this is actually a point that he makes at the very beginning of this uh, episode or essay. He actually refers to these as essays, uh, which I loved. Um, so at the beginning of this, this essay, he, uh, he says, justice is a universal of all cultures. Um, he says, justice is part of the biological equipment of man. And then he says, justice is a tightrope man walks between his desire to fill, fulfill his wishes and his acknowledgement of social responsibility. So, and then he says, um, an animal is either social or solitary. Man is alone in being a social solitary. In that we have a responsibility and a commitment to the group and a need for, um, you know, we're social animals and, you know, we do not do well, uh, completely isolated, but at the same time, we have, uh, we have these individual desires. We have, um, you know, these individual drives to, uh, make ourselves great. And he, he tends to have a bit of like a kind of great man theory in that like history and innovations have come about by, you know, individuals, you know, trying to better themselves and, uh, 
perfect their craft. So, so that's kind of the, the collide. And, and again, this quote, uh, justice is a tightrope man walks between his desire to fill, fulfill his wishes and his acknowledgement of social responsibilities. And um, this also kind of made me think, I, I recently read Civilization and its Discontents, and that, that's a kind of big point that Freud has as well, that we have these, you know, we have these individual desires, but then we also have to coexist and, you know, live in a, in a community. And, you know, at least Freud, Freud would say, this is what ca causes a lot of our neurosis is, you know, I want to, you know, I want to kill my neighbor. I want to have sex with that person, but it's not socially, you know, it, it doesn't conform to the, um, you know, my social responsibility. Um, but anyway, so I know that's a, that's a lot there, but what were your thoughts about, uh, social solitary? Yeah. The way, way in which I, I understand it is that we are his point is that we are social solitary so we are social in a very deep way and we are solitary in a very deep way and yeah. both those are core parts of who we are we are mm -hmm. social in the sense that if you look at your life how much do you owe to other people for people's work um mm -hmm. people in the past people in the present it is humongous and we're yeah. talking in language. Language is all, you know, a social creation over mm. a period of time. So you, you take in everything that the society has produced. Mm. And our life depends on it. Yet, all new things are created by an individual having a vision, imagining something, having the courage and the confidence to work it all out and to create something. So all new things that are being created are being created, are being motivated by an individual, are created by an individual. So in that sense, the all these social good, you know, goods that we're talking about are the result of individual creation. Mm. And moment a society which doesn't respect that is going to become stagnant and start to die. Mm. So at the same time, an individual by themselves, if they were try to cut itself, cut themselves off from the society, their ability to produce goes down dramatically. Right. So, so it is social and it is individual. And for example, the, the, again, going back to the founding fathers, e pluribus unum, the one in many. That is the idea mm -hmm. that the individuals are the many. Society is the one. And you have to structure things so that the many can flourish in a way. And the one has the stability that provides stability for all these individual actions from many to produce, um, not hurt each other, and provide means of bouncing off one another in order to produce much more value than what individuals themselves can produce. So I think one in many captures the heart of this point of social solitary. Mm, that was great. That was great. And I liked what you were saying because you were kind of talking a little bit about language and, um, you know, if, if give an example of a, you know, a human born on a desert Island, they're not taught anything. They're not around anybody. They're basically having to figure out everything from scratch. You know, you and I, you know, we have the ability to read the ability to communicate and, you know, this gift of language, which allows us to, gather all of the insights from our ancestors for the last couple thousands of years and we're able to then you know stand on the shoulders of giants which i think that's a really big point and you were talking about earlier uh, again another um you know kind of difference between uh humans and you know other animals is our ability to do that and that you know the snake is starting from ground zero each you know each generation Whereas humans, 
you know, with our ability to communicate with our gift of language, we're able to pass on all of that knowledge and wisdom. And that's, you know, I think that's what he calls progress. Absolutely. I mean, uh, people like, um, you know, Merlin Donald do a very good job of talking mm-hmm. about this point. You know, they talk about, um, they, they call it, uh, he calls it external memory. Okay. So whether it is writing or whether it is furniture or whether it is cities that you build is external memory. It is, mm. and what external memory, it is a product of individual consciousness working to shape something, but is accessible and manipulable and useful to others. So it's the, okay. the middle term through which consciousnesses can interact with one another, whether through a book or a road. So is external, just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, is this similar to like, um, you know, I don't have to understand how to, I don't know, code or something like that, as long as I know that these other people in my society no, it is it is Have far no. it is far more um, far more down to earth concept. Mm. Um, when you look at a paper, when you're writing on the paper, okay, when you're writing with your pen, yeah, that is external memory. So what was there in your head is now on paper. Okay, okay. And what that does, and the, the biggest innovation, I I think the biggest invention, which moved everything forward, is writing. Mm. Um, because what it does is it ex- externalizes thought. Yeah, you are able to organize it externally, and other people are able to see it. And it's it's scaling of it both internally with a feedback loop, with your own consciousness, added with the feedback loop, with other consciousnesses which are uh, not necessarily present right there. Um, scales things up dramatically. Well, yeah, and it's, uh, I think he says something, I was trying to find the exact quote, but it's it's something like we are able to pull things and ideas apart and then put them back together again, which I know to get a little meta, which kind of what we did to prepare for this mm-hmm. discussion was we, we, you know, both you and I watched the the episode a few times and then kind of hashed out all the ideas, and then we kind of put them all on a big piece of paper and then kind of said, okay, well, this belongs over here, this belongs over here. And, you know, that's that kind of, sounds to me, that's that kind of external. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, okay. uh, exactly. So it's it's the map. I don't know whether you have it or not, but if you have the paper, you can- <laughs> I think I do, yeah. The 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 paper, um, so that, that's, that's, okay, that, that is this Your conversation, reason. you know? <laughs> How, how we put it put it all together and what we did was that we it's kind of initially getting individual kind of key concepts on paper first and seeing mm-hmm. the connections between them um, and both of us doing it together so we yeah. can say oh this needs to be added to it or this organization this needs to be grouped together uh, mm-hmm. and then figuring out what is the proper order of it all of it being done on paper uh, firstly, for just if I was doing it myself, I would need to do that. But yeah. doing this together with you enables, you know, both our thought processes, both our context mm. uh, to be brought to bear on, on the same thing. Well, and I think also what what I find interesting about it is for, I think, Bernofsky or at least the person editing the documentary, the order in which they presented the information uh, made the most sense or that, that kind of grouping of it. But for me, um, when I watched it the first time, I was like, man, he's all over the place. Like what the heck's going on? And I kind of needed to, like I said, take out all the ideas and then kind of reorganize them in, in a structure that made sense to me. And, you know, I, I know you did the same thing. And part of what our back and forth was, was finding kind of a way to, talk about the material that would, you know, make sense to both of us. Yes, exactly. It's kind of like (laughs) doing a map, doing a map of the territory uh, Uh in an abstracted way, and then kind of comparing the maps and bringing them together 
as mm. a way of navigating through through the territory. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. Maybe we can move on to the final part of the map. Yes. Um, so he talks about a little bit about um, his an ideal for the individual or kind of uh, what each of us as an individual should be striving for. And you kind of hinted on it earlier. Uh, part of what he sees us having a moral responsibility towards is seeking knowledge and the kind of questioning. And, you know, I think he harps on that a lot throughout this series is that, you know, the moment we stop questioning, like, and just kind of revert back to dogma or old ideas, um, you know, that's when the, the, culture will become stagnant and that's when you know basically the the culture will end so i think that's one of the one of the big ideas and the other one is he tells a story at at the very end about uh while shooting this episode a cameraman went up in a plane to film and the plane actually crashed and he was having a conversation with the person who was going to, you know, be the next cameraman and get on the next plane to go up. And he's kind of saying like, you know, are you nervous or are you, are you considering not doing it? And this guy said, I am scared, but it's my job and I have to do it anyways. So I think he makes a point there too, that we all have kind of a personal responsibility or, you know, moral obligation to to our craft and to kind of perfecting our craft as an individual and that's i think what he sees leading to progress kind of like we talked about earlier it's individuals you know trying to get a little bit better a little bit better at the thing that they're doing um that you know moves society forward yeah, absolutely. Um, I like his phrase, you know, personal commitment to one's own skill mm. is the cause of ascent of man. So individuals saying, you know, that I'm committed to my own skill. Another yeah. way in which he expresses it is in terms of taking responsibility for your own integrity. Mm. Um, you know, he's talking, you know, it, it, this theme appears again and again, you know, it's, it's basically your own kind of judgment mm. of saying, this is what is right. This is what is good and taking full responsibility for it and forging a path. Uh, typically, whether it is a scientist or an artist, um, you know, they are out there on the limb yeah. on their own. And they have to have that confidence in their own skill, in their own being, in their own integrity, even when people around them don't seem to get it or are actively hostile mm. um, to it. And that is what moves us forward. Yeah, and it's it's a, a complicated thing. I. I... I thought about, um, you know, a few podcasts ago, somehow we were, we got into talking about, um, AI and artificial intelligence and the people working on AI. And we were talking about how, you know, even if somehow we were to know that creating AI would, would be a fatal thing to do. And I still don't think there would be any stopping, stopping it because as we've talked about, earlier like the the nature of humans is change and the nature is to constantly better themselves so i think some of it is maybe we're not we have such a commitment to perfecting our craft that uh i don't want to say it doesn't matter what the goal is but maybe the goal itself is the maybe the goal itself is getting better as opposed to the goal is to create this thing to help humanity or, or and whatnot. It, 
Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, he has a different view mm. uh, in that last episode. What he's saying is that if you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, you should try to take responsibility for everything. You should try to understand the consequences of what you're doing. Uh, you're seeing, you're trying to, because uh, if you are one step ahead of everybody else in being able to understand something and doing, you know, and being able to do something technologically, then you should take the responsibility of saying, is this a good thing? What does it do to human beings? Mm. Under what conditions we can protect and thrive uh, at the same time. Um, so that is what he's talking about of kind of taking taking responsibility. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it was a little bit, I had it kind of conceptualized a little bit differently. Um, well, that was kind of the end of my notes. Were there any kind of things that we maybe missed or jumped over i'm no, sure i think i think we did a good job of taking <laughs> okay. notes so we had a map and we've gone through the map <laughs> awesome well cool if if you're happy i'm happy yes i'm very happy Beautiful. Um, well let's call it there i'm um yeah thanks so much for for coming on we've kind of been chatting about these ideas for the last week or so we were you know at a mutual friend's wedding and trying to be respectful not to uh be talking about Brzezinski when the bride was coming down the aisle, <laughs> um, but we finally got a chance to to let loose and um, explore some of these ideas. So wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Zach. This was uh, this is a great delight. I uh, always like speaking to you, so this is this is a great uh, great chance to speak to you about something that I'm really really uh, interested in. All right, uh, awesome. so now let's get everybody in and um, let's go to the next phase of this meetup. All right, folks. So now it's your turn. So please tell me what you think. You know, many of you have been looking at it for, uh, you know, looking at this topic for some time. You've been watching, you've been participating in the Ascent of Man. Um, I would like to hear what you got from this. Um, this is a first experiment that um, we're doing of kind of doing this kind of long form, fairly structured presentation on a, you know, on this was on a video, but it could be on anything. Um, and so what did you get from it? Um, especially if you're familiar with this series and with this particular episode, I really want to hear from you. Go ahead and type exclamation mark. Please take your time uh, to talk about what, what you think. All right, so it's going to be Judith followed by Joe. Judith. Um, thank you for the discussion. It was very nice and very interesting to listen to you both. I enjoyed very much. Um, Zach, I just wanted to say that um, I recall you from uh, another meetup group. And so it was good to see and hear you as well. Um, so um, let's see. Um, the last, where, where should I start? I do have a question, but. Um, sure, uh, Judith, take your time. This is, this okay. is long form because I, I want to hear what, what was the impact of it? What, what's, you know, so please take your time, go ahead. Okay, well, very many things very, um, well, most things just very similar to what you were both discussing. So I'm just gonna point out things that I just wanted to add a little bit of my take on. Please. Um, Actually, just what you were saying, Shrikan, I'll just start there about um, the scientists uh, having the responsibility to think about, um, you know, the consequences of their actions because they have the knowledge. Um, of course, that's true. But I also think in the beginning of the episode, he talked about that being that there will be specialization and that he doesn't you know, in our society, you cannot expect to know everything. So there will be specialization, but it is um, each individual's responsibility of the whole society, each individual in the society for um, those ethical decisions too, as well. So we cannot, so I just want to, you know, I'm sure you probably didn't mean, but you, if we relied on scientists to make our ethical decisions, um, that would be bad also. So we want our scientists to be ethical, but we, want, we don't want to rely on them for our 
um, ethical decisions as a society. Um, uh, excellent point. Uh, Judith, I'm going to just interact a little bit as uh, so that that way, um, you know, I don't have to inter I don't have to answer all the points. I think that's a brilliant point. I think what he's saying is that it is individual's responsibility. It's very similar to what Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, emphasizes that you have to take responsibility for your life and you have to take as much responsibility as you can. Uh, so uh, exactly. Please go ahead. Okay, and then um, there was, you know, a lot of discussion about um, societies becoming static cultures and, and why that is. And um, I felt he was also giving us a cautionary um, message that um, we, we can't always see what is going to cause us to become static. So some of our systems that we may think are not are increasing like, oh, we have the internet. Oh, we have all this knowledge. Um, they may have some elements that we need to be aware of. Like we might be seeing them only as like, oh, lots of extra information. Um, so this is a good thing. And this makes us less static and, and um, brings knowledge to more people. But um, I'm not an expert. I just, <laughs> obviously, but I just feel like that there are elements we should be careful about and and there and we should keep those in the back of our mind that hmm what are we doing here and and like what could be some of the drawbacks of, of this absolutely work. um, um but the way in which the founding fathers thought of this is that they yeah. also always called for eternal vigilance nothing uh -huh. is automatic you know uh -huh. all kinds of things can have all kinds of negative effects and you have to kind of you have to be aware you have to be vigilant uh, on on all of this excellent point go ahead could, yep. I, uh, could I jump in? Um, I think you're right, Judy. I think he's definitely uh, kind of warning warning us. He kind of says like explicitly, if if we don't, you know, carry the torch, uh, I think he says something like Shakespeare and uh, Newton will be like the relics of, I can't remember the exact quote, but, but yeah, he basically says, uh, yeah, if, if we don't kind of carry the torch forward, somebody will but he'll kind of be sad that uh you know it it won't be in its current iteration but um what was i gonna say oh man totally lost my train of thought. that's all right that's okay all right. okay come back uh judith go ahead okay um so then the other things that i um i noted other than the things you said but um he that i so in the very end he's like trying to make a point he's saying Above all, what we are are ethical creatures. So responsibility and um, for integrity of what we are, above all, what we are as ethical creatures. And he had this long story about his friend, John, John von Neumann or something, you know, who um, ended up um, spending his valuable resource of time um, for power reasons. I thought it was interesting that he was, you know, willing to go out there with this specific example, but it was good that he did, you know, so he was no longer um, expanding, von Neumann, he's his friend, you know, no longer expanding his knowledge um, um, and helping people, you know, to understand knowledge. He was more driven by power. Um, so something to be cautious about. And then, Judith, Judith we, let me comment on that one. Yeah. Um, see, this is what I find really remarkable about Bronowski. He is a man of a very different culture. You know, he's coming like both epistemologically, ethically, the way he's thinking is very different from how most people think today. He is far more integrative in terms of just epistemology of understanding things. He's also very integrative in terms of ethics of saying, you know, these things have consequence and you have to be aware of it. You have to take a, uh, you know, take responsibility. It is so different and so refreshing to hear yeah, yeah. that. Go ahead. Yeah, it was, it was really refreshing. So then he says, um, what needs to be commonplace in schools? Because you were also talking about children and curiosity, and that's actually where I'm gonna leave off with a question. Um, but he said in what needs to be commonplace in, in school books is our origins, our understanding of our evolution, 
our history and our progress. He didn't say science, well, those things are important. I'm not saying they're not important, but he didn't say, you know, science or math or whatever, but without an understanding of, you know, our origins, our evolution, our history, like the history of failed cultures as well, so that we can identify and not step into the same thing. Um, and our progress and our pitfalls, those are the things that are gonna help us, guide us to make good ethical choices, I think. Um, so I really like that. Excellent. Um, um, uh, let, let me let me comment. It's, this is Judith. These are all really fantastic points. Um, what, I mean, the point that Zach was making about you know not making Newton and Shakespeare relics. This is to the heart of that. What, what he's saying is that this is a living tradition. Okay, you really need to grasp how we got here and what kind of thinking got us here. You can't just take the attitude that goods are here because then you will not be able to actually keep the goods. You have to understand kind of the moral, epistemological, ethical, uh, you know, just everything that is needed to produce this. And in, in a way, he has actually given that to us uh, better than anything that um, I have seen. Because if you look at the, you know, if you consider his series, right? He has so much empathy. He is able to put himself in the position of this metal worker, the sword person who is making the sword. Um, he's able to put himself in a person who is working in, uh, you know, structuring, uh, you know, the, the Inca city. Um, he's able to put himself in the shoes of, you know, people like Lavoisier. Um, and what it, what, what it was like. And he is able to give us a sense of who these people were, what they faced and what they did with it. And they were, and if you do that, you basically see what being human is all about. And you need that as a base in, to, in order to be human. And that's what he's giving us. Go ahead. Yep. So um, here's my question, okay? Regarding children, um, he, he says, um, you know, for most of, most of history, children have been asked to simply conform to the image, okay? They, uh, civilizations fail and then the, that they limit the freedom of the imagination of the young. And um, he says, um, you know, children are, so my question is, if children are characterized by curiosity, and curiosity is the hallmark of humans, um, then why for most of human history have they been asked to, I mean, have they been asked to conform? And at times when the um, societies have leaped forward, or it appears that they have, I, I mean, I, I don't know enough history, but I, I can't seem to map that, that it's been because children have had extra access or you know, their imagination has been, not been limited. It seems more like there have been individuals in those societies with extra integrity and, and um, the gift of access maybe. Um, so I'm really just wondering like, what, what was it in history that allowed certain people to make those contributions, Pythagoras or Newton or anybody? And is it a, a cultural thing really, or is it an individual thing that pops out here and there, uh, like a virus or something? Um, yeah, that's, that's my question. Amazing. Uh, Zach, would you like to answer it? And then I'll... Um, so I understood, are, are you kind of saying, like, why is it that, we kind of keep making that same mistake that Plato made and, and why do cultures kind of become static if it- uh, Let, let, if, let, let me try to phrase okay. the question and then yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it, then you can go ahead okay. and add yes. to it. Um, so I think she's asking two things. So one is that if it is true that longest childhood is the hallmark of man, mm -hmm. why is it that most cultures regard, don't regard that, are not based on that, but 
of having the ceiling as the as snake as the ideal mm. uh, for human beings. Why is that? Secondly, okay. is why is it that some individuals still manage, even in those cultures, to move things forward to be continue you know continue to do that? I think the best answer I have for it, which is not a very good answer, it's a profound question, fantastic question, Judith. Um, the the thing is, I can think about it in terms of order and chaos and what is easy and what is hard. It is very easy to imitate. See, we have got very large brains and we are quite capable of imitating and not just at a, like a very simple level, but at a very deep level, very complex things. And doing that is very easy and it is also very safe. It is also already the order has been created in the society. All you have to do is to, as a child, is to imitate it until you get it and then you're done. You continue to do that. It is an effortless way of proceeding. The alternative is that you have to think on your own. You have to reformulate, look at the world through your own eyes try to put together what you understand about it. Many, often what most people have missed and then actually put it together in your own head, make it alive in physical reality, often in opposition to what everybody else is doing and saying. It is enormously hard. So it takes intellectual courage, it requires integrity. It requires, so the maintaining of that curiosity is not, is not given. So yes, longest childhood characterizes human beings, but that childhood for human beings, long as it is, ends. And then you need explicit commitment to your own skills, explicit taking responsibility for your own integrity in order to go beyond that. That's what he says is the ethical ideal. Most societies as a society have never done that. They have regarded the king, the top-down system as a safe way of doing it. In that sense, enlightenment and America go the opposite way. They enshrine the child. They enshrine the individuals as being the prime movers and then try to build a system appropriate for them. I'm not saying that it is a perfect system, but it's a dramatic reversal of history. And to the extent to which each person succeeds in doing that, even under these situations, even after that, there is, most people will have the tendency of doing the imitation, going with whatever structure is there. Breaking new ground is hard. It requires taking risks um, and facing, facing chaos on your own. Could I okay. jump Please. in a little bit, add Please. to that? I think it's yeah. also just, and you kind of said this as well, like our, we have a desire for certainty and we don't like uncertainty. At least most of us don't. And it's very rare that we find something that works. So when we finally do have find something that works, we want to kind of cling to it. And, you know, it doesn't matter that, okay, the environment's changing or there are new technological innovations and the ways that we used to do things don't work anymore. We still want to kind of cling to this thing that has worked in the past and to use kind of an analogy um i think of like stand-up comedians like stand-up comedians when they're trying out new material they probably have like a 10 percent, not even probably a five percent hit rate of a joke working so when they finally do get a joke that works they covet it and it becomes like a part of their a, par a part of their set and you see, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've heard like Jerry Seinfeld, he said one of the hardest things for him was once he finally got an hour of good material after 
years and years, he found it really hard to alter from that or to vary his set in any ways, any way, because he knew that like, you know, it's really hard to find something that works and most jokes don't. So he just kind of like coveted this one hour of material and was, you know, afraid to change that at all. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's a thank you unhelpful analogy, but that's kind of how I, I think about it. Excellent. I mean, I, I, I agree. It's it willingness to, and, you know, to endure discomfort, failures, uh, all, all kinds of negatives um, in order to do that. Next up is going to be Joe, Charlie, and Jeff. Joe. So I, I really like the format. Um, I thought you guys did a great job. I mean, a lot of the things that uh, I had highlighted about this chapter, um, you had touched upon. So uh, I'll take that as confirmation that I'm on the right track. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that, it, you know, this is really uh, instructive that it actually gave me a little bit more context to what the episode was actually saying. And you guys were able to also bring it into some more recent times and, 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 and draw some analogies into today's world. So that's very, very helpful. Um, there, are, there are kind of, there's a, Bunch of notes I can go over really quickly. I'll just go over a few, sure. Um, and 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 not try and go too long here. Is that? But the one uh, quote that uh, that uh, Zach had mentioned was the you know justice is universal to all cultures, and it is a tightrope that man walks between his desire to fulfill his wishes and his acknowledgement to social responsibility, and that gets into the social solitary um balance and i find that to be such a critical part of the episode and in that actually led him to think of that justice or or uh, that justice is actually part of our biology which is a very very different way of thinking altogether um and it shows you how important it is because i think about this in terms of how nations fail I think often nations that have a uh, corrupt uh, system often fail because the people see there's a lack of justice and there's a lack, so I can think of it, and there's a lack of progress in those societies many times. Um, there, there is a book that Why Nations Fail that actually kind of covers this in, in a lot of detail. So they compared us and Mexico as one example and how somebody like Carlos Slim uh, really wasn't brought uh, up, uh, wasn't, wasn't uh, questioned at all uh, when it came to certain business practices. And somebody like Bill Gates was at least the Justice Department when it came to Netscape, actually brought him um, uh, brought him to court, and I thought that that was just an interesting thing because I think when we're talking about progress, how justice is actually so critical to how we progress as a society. Um, but one of the most interesting points that I thought, and it's everybody's already touched upon it. Uh, let, let me interrupt on this sure. point. I want to say uh, that actually I disagree a little bit. Sure, with, uh, Jacob Bronowski. Uh, because I don't think the primary thing about justice is avoiding the negative. Because justice is actually needed, proper social interaction is actually needed in order to achieve the positive as well. How do you work together? How do you actually bring the many to get together? I mean, one part of it is that not harm each other. But that is relatively smaller, I think than saying, okay, what kind of system will allow us to gain from each other? Because that too has to be learned. That is not automatic uh, for, for a social being. Uh, go ahead, uh, well, you know, and but, but it's something interesting because I was watching uh, uh, the origins of anger and they went back to primates. And what happened was when something was unseen as unfair, that was actually when they got angry. And that tears from the social construct. If you start to see a system as unjust or unfair, mm -hmm. then you actually, it pulls away from the social construct that you're actually, your society as a whole. 
So right. something I mean, that, like uh, that's absolutely true. But yeah. what I'm saying is that when the system is just, so take for example a company, when the way in which the company treats people is just, actually people produce a lot more. So right. it's not just that injustice hurts, but justice actually helps the positive uh, part. Oh, absolutely. I, I th- well, I think it's fundamental. And, and he sees it as biological, mm-hmm. like almost like, and that, that, that it's like part of our, mm-hmm. our DNA. Um, and, and I thought that that was, that, that is true. I feel that that, that part is kind of true. It, 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 but the other interesting part was um, when we were talking about uh, that, he says history, of course, does not stand still between the nomad and the Renaissance. The ascent of man has never come to a stop, but the ascent of, of the young, the ascent of the talented, the ascent of the imaginative, they, that, they become halting at many times in between. And I find that to be a really important point. Um, and he goes into as to why that is. Um, and some of those are the social constructs that like that essentially exist where um, he specifically mentions the church and how in uh, like if you're a clever boy growing up, the only way you were going to actually get your ideas were out there were throughout the church. But now he, he, he says, you have a commandment that shall not question if you're going through the church and it moves into this dogmatism that actually prevents you from making scientific progress. Uh, so that's, I, I thought was really an important part of the episode because I feel like in a way many time our educational systems are doing that today, not intentionally, not to necessarily even to maintain power. It's just they're set up structurally as a, 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 um, as a, uh, I th- and Yasuhiko talked about this a little bit today, like they're not necessarily, they're kind of creating, I, I would say more better, employees than than say better citizens is that and maybe that's one way to say it um but i i find that to be still relevant to what something that he was talking about today um uh, one of the other things that i think exactly you were talking that you you drove blank on um was uh where he talked about when scientific civil, civilizations uh and the integrity of knowledge and how that's crucial and that this is, I found to be pretty profound because it was, it was uh, what, 50 years ago. Uh, if we do not take the next step in the ascent of man, it'll be taken by people elsewhere like China. Uh, so that he, you know, he was kind of predicting, he says, you know, it doesn't necessarily make me, it's not, it's neither way. It, it, you know, I'm not saying that's good or bad, uh, but he said it does make me a little bit sad that we're not progressing the way we should. Um, and I guess my question is, well, wh- why aren't we progressing the way we should is, would be one question. Um, maybe that's a too broad of a question, uh, but. Uh, uh, so um, I, I mean, he points to some things. So one of the things that he points to is kind of subject is subjectivism. Okay. Of kind of emotionalism, kind of primacy of emotions and kind of going back in many ways to a more primitive state. Because if you look at what he's looking at, you know, what, what he's focused on is that he's focused on the progress of science and technology. And um, what he's saying is that the culture is kind of becoming more emotionalist, more off the moment, more short range, losing contact with kind of larger patterns, forgetting the history, forgetting the context, being driven by more short range emotions of television, whatever. Um, so I think that, that, that is one of the things that he points out. And I think that is, that's very uh, prescient. I think, I think he got, uh, he, he's, he's got something. So it's, um, 
you know, kind of the television culture, basically, as opposed to, so in that sense, what he's doing with the documentaries, I have to tell you the story of the coming of make, of actually creation of these documentary. So um, David Attenborough, when he took over BBC Two, he was given full range of full uh, freedom to choose what programming he would do for BBC Two, which was a new station. And he chose to do these documentaries, uh, Civilization and Ascent of Man as the first two documentaries. And everybody told him that that is insane. Nobody is going to watch anything which is not funny. In any case, they will not watch anything more than 30 minutes. And 13 episodes? That's just nuts. And about things like civilization and science? That's just not. So in that sense, he's actually going against that television. He was part of the part of the uh, culture that went against that television culture. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, that, that's, then that's fantastic. And one more, I have one more question about the, the, this idea between um, the, he calls it the age old conflict, uh, conflict between intellectual leadership and civil authority. Uh, and then he goes and talks about, and you guys mentioned this, that, you know, Socrates, Jonathan Swift, whomever it may be. Um, but he, t- he seems to think that the state, and, and I might be misinterpreting what he's saying, the state um, and that science and the state sometimes are at odds, like that it, they, it becomes corrupted if it gets too close to the state. Um, is that what he's really saying in that particular instance? I mean, I, I, it was hard for me to really kind of parse out what he, he was actually kind of, uh, kind of trying to communicate with the relationship between, and he mentioned Einstein uh, as, as an example. Um, and yes, also, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, what he's saying is that when science becomes completely in bed with the government, with you know, in, in that, then the entire system of, so for, for example, entire system of kind of feedback loop of science is undercut by that, because then you are, you're trying to do proposals in order to get the funding. You're doing the kinds of proposals that are going to get you funding, regardless of whether you think that those are the best ones. Um, The dramatic example of that was uh, Michael Milken. Um, Michael Milken, he was put in prison and when he was about to be released, he found out that he had prostate cancer. Yes. And he he found out everything he could about that. And he managed to sneak into a prostate cancer research um, conference. And he started asking them questions. And after a while, he said, look, I'm Michael Milken. What is it that is stopping you from making progress on prostate cancer? Because this is a personal interest. He says, they said, look, look, firstly, if I have an innovative idea, I cannot ask for the funding because nobody will understand it and I will not get funding for it. So I have to use my fifth based idea to get funding. It takes about a year or two for me to put together the proposal and another two years to get the funding. By that time, I have actually 10 better ideas than, than the fifth best idea that I had. And then I have to restrict research only to that based on that. So he changed the way in which it was. He said, look, he started an organization which would give $100,000 funding to any idea. They had to write one page proposal for it. And he would just give you $100,000 to be used in any way you want with just one condition that he would have a conference once a year where everybody who has gotten funding comes and shares all their findings together. So he cut, because what happens is that after you do the research, you, it takes four years to publish something and only things which are peer reviewed or people that everybody already agrees with gets published. So he undercut all of that so that people could actually make, uh, you know, make rapid progress and the prostate cancer you can see that see the graph of you know the deaths death rate of prostate that's an example of what he's talking about 
that if you make a closed loop between inquiry and funding for that inquiry, like science, and it becomes completely beholden to that kind of funding, that's going to take it away from what science can be. That's a, that's a fantastic example. Yeah, I mean, because like that, that really communicates what he was saying as far as like, you know, where it becomes part of a, um, uh, where, where people become cynical about science. And, and, and he actually mentions that specifically. So I think that, 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 that that's a phenomenal example of how science can be corrupted by processes that actually need to be put in place in certain cases as checks and balances, but at certain points they become suffocating and overwhelming. So, um, I, and, I, and, I, and it's amazing how uh, appropriate these things are to today's world. I mean, he's pinpointed a lot of the things that we just talked about, whether it be about schooling, whether it be about re scientific research, and whether it be about even the way we were functioning as a, a society with a, a so, so, um, uh, social and solitary. I think those three things, really, he, he captured it 50 years ago and warned us. And I think we've actually gone the way he would have predicted uh, had he been here today. Um, so uh, I, I thank you both for clarifying um, that. I love the format. It was a fantastic format. Uh, and I thank you both for clarifying this episode. Now I know why it's Street Con's favorite. <laughs> sure. Because and, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think one of the things I'm liking about this format is this. See, I'm able to talk to Judith and you in such great detail here and kind of go back and forth with you. I think that's, 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 that's some, we're onto something here too. Well, and I think that this is something that is, uh, and I, it, this is important. It's, it's, it's unique to Srikant. You're able to pull that example of the Milken Institute, or, or I think is that, that that's probably you're referring to as Milken yeah. Institute, is that you're able to pull that example and contrast that with what he was saying. And I, you know, that's the type of where we really start to see uh, how these things work together. So I, I, I do think that this is, we're, we're really leveraging your talents as best we possibly can, and it's helping everybody. And so, no, 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 I, I object, I strongly object. I'm, we are also leveraging your talents and Judith's talents so far. Because look at the range of observations Judith had and how many different things. And so we could, we could kind of go, so, you know. Oh, you need somebody to comment to, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that, that, so, I mean, but, but, but I, I think that this is a good way of actually pulling that information out. Um, so this, well, this you. is, thank you. I thank, you know, thank you. And I'm, I appreciate the time and sorry I took up so much. Wonderful. Uh, next up. No, I think, I think this is very good. I see my, my standard is that, Every two minutes, people should feel that they are glad that they lived it. I think we are living up to that. I'm, I'm very, very confident about that. Uh, next up is Charlie. Charlie, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to put... S sorry, uh, you, you muted yourself, Charlie. Okay, I, I muted myself. Okay. Uh, okay, I see, I see what I did wrong. Uh, okay, um, let me see here. I want to make sure that I do this right. What are you trying to do, Charlie? I I'm trying to post something on chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the, I see. So it did. Um, okay. Uh, basically, uh, first of all, I want to talk about uh, uh, the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, and this is true in China too. Uh, what happens in history is that there are people who want power and they will use any means to get it. Now, historically, what that what that boils down to is owning property, because uh, civilizations have, until recently, until the uh, uh, the industrial revolution, were agricultural. So, if you owned property, you had a guaranteed source of income because you'd have serfs that would be taking care of um, the property. Uh, Charlie, one thing: uh, I don't want to go too much into politics because this is generally kind of you know we. we're, well, we were talking about how the how how things uh, how elements of oppression. Sure ideas and, and that, that's intrinsically political i don't see how you can get around it okay let, let, let's try it for a few minutes go ahead okay but anyway uh, uh elaine pagos talks about the uh, uh the 
formation of the Catholic Church, okay, the early history actually before the formation, and, and what was going on there between the Gnostics and, and, and the early uh, people who started the, uh, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And, uh, and they, were, they were very dogmatic, and, and, and Constantine, I believe, saw that the people that he was, he was um, uh, ha having implement the, the, the Catholic Church were people that were going to be hospitable to the idea of, of uh, authoritarian rule. And, uh, and so this has been going on for, for uh, a long time. And Thomas Jefferson, uh, when, uh, when uh, you know, he wrote the Constitution, he, had, he stated that he thought there was going to have to be another revolution every 20 years. Because the people who have this, this urge to, uh, to control everything, they're not going to just give up and say, oh, I, I, I'm going to be a nice guy now because people voted that they don't like nasty people. But Charlie, and, uh, uh, on, on Jefferson, I think um, there are two people. Like Jefferson is the visionary and he was able to kind of vision, kind of create visions of what is possible. But the person who really understands structure of how, what kind of structures that make something work is Madison. Um, he's very deep of saying, okay, what kind of checks and balances you need to do uh, around what various dimensions, whether it is kind of local versus state versus federal, uh, in terms of time, you know, what do you what do you set to be two years? What do you set to be four years? What do you set to be six years? What responsibility do you give to each of those? I think Madison is is really the person who kind of figured it out. So Jefferson's, uh, you know, Jefferson is more kind of a visionary on that. I think. Yeah, what I, the way I see, I, I agree with what you're saying, uh, 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 but the the um, uh, the ascent of man, as I understand it, is a vision of human potential. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and it's not about uh, developing structures of, of society. Ooh. Okay, so so it, 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 in a sense, you know that Bronowski himself is a visionary. So yeah. he's 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 um, uh, uh, continuing in the in the footsteps of Thomas Jefferson, and and uh, and working out the details of how you accomplish this is very is very is very important. Okay, I'm not you know I'm not denigrating that in any way, uh, but um, uh, let me see here. Um, okay, that's Elaine Poggles. Uh, uh, okay, um, in, in more recent times, uh, uh, there's um, uh, liberty and justice for some. What's going on today, okay? Like I said- uh, let, Let's do one thing, um, Charlie. Uh, yeah. You know, this meetup, you know, we try to keep on, on the topic of, so in terms of like longest childhood, instead of going and looking at works of other people, Tell me what you think about the episode itself, about, you know, that, that's what, you know, because what, what happens is everybody is focused on that. So to have like a common point on which we can discuss, because what is going to happen is that if you bring in kind of works of lots of other people, then yeah. people will not have the common context to appreciate yeah. it. So uh, please tell me what, what you thought of the episode itself. What, what, what are your observations? Okay, well, towards the end, you know, he, he, he did say, he was talking about uh, the place of science within a society. And uh, unfortunately, he did not get to meet Ian McGilchrist uh, or read in any of his books. And so, so I think that's a big uh, uh, sad thing that happened. But uh, uh, basically, this vision of, of, of the relationship of science to society has to do with um, how science is envisioned. Uh, and he had this thing about the, kind of this childlike. He, I, I think the reason that he referred to John, John von Neumann as Johnny, okay, mm -hmm. was this idea that, that, that uh, Johnny, uh, like a little boy, had this childlike enthusiasm towards science and that he was uh, developing these ideas as kind of a play, a sense of play. And uh, uh, and and uh, a uh, you know that that is in terms of trying to develop a structure, especially in the sense of Madison. How are we how are we going to be able to? Because right now we're in the process of 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 our culture being taken over by multinational corporations, and one element of that is this book by Robert McLaughlin, uh, "The Crime of Reason." He's a he's a 1998. Uh, uh, Lord, uh, Nobel laureate in physics. And uh, basically what he's saying is, is what's going on right now is, is something that was never allowed before and the founding fathers were dead set against it. And that was the patenting of ideas. Now you could patent an object, a physical object, 
and you could gain uh, uh, financial rewards for, for developing a physical object, but you couldn't patent an idea, but now you can, okay? Uh, thanks to, um, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, uh, it's a, it was just a, it, um, Monsanto, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, who it's now part of Bayer, but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's basically now it's software. You can, pro, you can, you can patent the program. It, it's just, it's crazy. And he goes into that. And that's one of the things Robert McLaughlin goes into that, mm -hmm. that basically you, it's we're clamping down what's going on. You know, and also the, you know, people want to have internet uh, neutrality, but the larger corporations, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. We're, we're going to, we're going to run the show because right now uh, owning land is not that big of a deal because the, the number of people needed to, um, to, to produce crops is only like 5% of the population. Before it was 80%. So if you owned land, you essentially had control over 80% of the population. Now, you know, you own land and you have control over 5%. Indirectly, I mean, you, you, can, you can try to raise the prices and play, play games with the market, but, but right now it's uh, 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 the, um, uh, the, the, the place where the money is, is in technology. And if you look at the richest people in the world, they're all, you know, IT type people, not all, about half. Uh, Charlie, what, uh, what, uh, have you watched this series before? Uh, I may have some time ago, but okay. uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, back uh, when I was watching, you know, uh, um, uh, when I had um, oh. rabbit ears or something oh. like that. <laughs> but what, what, what stands, you know, from this episode, what stands, what kind of remains with you? Well, for me, it's it's just what he's talking about at the end. You know that that basically, it, uh, he he started off at the very beginning talking about these uh, these African cultures where the, these little children were being imprinted, so to speak. You know, with this this necessity for them to become adults as as early as they can, because that's so that they could take their place within their within that culture, and uh, and so it, 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 he he started that with that, and then he ended with. Um, uh, how are we going to make sure that we don't fall into that same trap? And, uh, and, and for me, I, I think that the, the, the signs that are everywhere is that we are very rapidly falling into that trap. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Charlie. Um, I'm going to have uh, next uh, is going to be Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Well, this is, um, this is quite a tour de force. <laughs> <laughs> of, of ideas and, and questions. And um, I really just want to start out by, by expressing my gratitude to, to Zach for, uh, for organizing this with you, Shrikant, and giving you the time, as, as, as Joe especially was saying, to actually give um, um, context and, and, and nuance and, and metaphors um, and examples. Uh, as part of your uh, uh, teachable moment that, that Zach has helped to create here. So Zach, I want to thank you for that. And, um, and, and Judith and, and, and Joe and Charlie. So um, what, what this made me think is, I think what, I, what I've been going through lately is a bit of um, uh, of the of, of Bob Dylan's song, I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. That um, uh, can, can you repeat? Uh, you, you broke up in the middle. What, what what is the line from the song? I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. Mm -hmm. And I think that that on so many levels, for me personally, in some of the things that I've been exploring, even things that 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 I thought I knew quite a bit about. <laughs> um, that uh, after spending a great deal amount of time considering them, uh, what I've discovered from all that experience and, and reflection is that I know much less than, than, than I thought I did. The closer I get to it, the less I feel I really know. And that's among the reasons that I prize questions over conclusions so firmly but in in this in this consideration uh, Jeff, Jeff, uh, let, let me let me say one thing about this I, I think that is the heart of the scientific ethos 
like when you when people used to ask newton like newton to everybody else was like god you know it's like he knew everything okay but i really like how he saw himself he says i don't know how other people uh what i appear to be to other people but as for myself i seem to have been a boy on the seashore who has just discovered some shells is being shinier than others um and i think that is the approach that i see in all of scientists of a one of of humility in the face of of nature it's a kind of a very odd combination of pride and humility of confidence and humility uh newton was confident i mean if there is any anybody who is confident he is that but at the same time he has that humility uh together and that combination i think uh is 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 a powerful one uh, so uh, go ahead jeff i i appreciate that and and i agree and i think that it is actually at the heart of many many things i think it is why adults would be frightened by the questions and uh and potential creativity of um of children because they're kind of questioning the conclusions that those adults have reached and the systems and structures and and economies and political systems that they created as a result and and the child sees all that and says well okay here's i can tell this is working and that isn't right <laughs> and and the person who um has reached those conclusions and organized their lives and and their societies and their families by those conclusions goes into a defense of those conclusions and there you have it you know um the the focus on order and certainty even certainty about things that it's impossible to have certainty about and yet defending conclusions to the death and um and putting to death historically those that that continue to hold on to their questions to their doubts um as heresy i i just think that that's a really big part of of civilization and human history and uh societies as a whole as well as all of our organizations and relationships and um one of the things that really struck me about what you were sharing in many different ways this evening was that whether it's uh creativity and responsibility or whether it's social and solitary whether it's um kind of you know norms and uh and free pursuit of things uh the whole the whole focus on justice i think that that um when people use the word balance between these various things it's sort of a desire to simplify them in some way but i think what they all are are relationships and the, and and relationships are complicated and always changing and playing off each other and um sometimes independent sometimes interdependent um sometimes building on what is and sometimes inventing something new maybe maybe standing on the shoulders of giants maybe contradicting the you know the conclusions of giants and that that those relationships as uh um, Uh, as sometimes respectful and sometimes revolutionary as they might be are at the heart of of progress and uh and creativity and not hurting each other and uh anyway those were some of my reflections on all these different topics as you were as you were going through them and uh and playing with them a bit and answer asking more questions about them and um but i really appreciated this evening it was very very thoughtful and 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 powerful as a result wonderful uh thank you thank you jeff i want to comment on this your bob dylan quote 
quote. Um, I think what happens is that most people, when they are young, they are trying to make their way in the world. And they're trying to take in the systems of the world and figuring out how to fit in in order to make a living, in order to get a house, in order to get married, have children. Um, and a lot of the energy is going in saying, okay, what do I need to do in order to function here? And um, it's, and most people kind of, I think midlife crisis is about people actually succeeding in whatever they set out to do. And then kind of feeling empty of saying, is this all? And then they have opportunity of saying, okay, I, now the problem with most people is that the values that they started pursuing were not their own. Those values were also from, gotten from the society. So they are, they don't have the capacity of generating their own vision of what is possible. And then, um, so I think there is an opportunity of saying, okay, now, let me see what I can do. So I think becoming young as you grow older is very natural. And it is actually, it's like you are nurturing the child in you. You are your own parent now. So you can actually be a child like you never were because now you can take the responsibility of being, being the parent and the child. Uh, together. So wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is Brian. I don't, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. So I had, uh, I did pay attention like the current recommended and I made some detailed notes. Oh my God. We, uh, and I'll skip over some, maybe I'll come back to them. Um, but I agree with uh, what was said earlier about these periods where the ascent of the young and the imaginative has stopped. And he did use the monasteries as an example in Erasmus. And it's where, uh, it's where the, the questions became, the, quest the answers were set, uh, the questions were, were all answered, supposedly all answered. The, the one thing I'd point out is that uh, in those systems, it tends, there are different ways of looking at these. Uh, one is through revelation, that, that tends to be religion. The answers are answered through revelation. Someone else tells you the answer. The, um, probably somebody who's thought about it in the past, reflecting on God or some other object, uh, or by figuring out yourself, uh, through your own life experience. And that tends to, you might call that the philosophy. And then the third one is scientific, which is uh, also, it's a form of agreement um, where everybody's assuring that they're focusing on the same physical object. And then they try to reach some agreement about cause and effect. Uh, or, Brian, what, what, what was the first one that you said? Second was philosophy, third was scientific. What is the first one? Revelation and religion. Got it. Got it. Okay. The um... oh no, I just lost. The th they they all have something in common. I forgot what that was. So, sorry about in the interruption. I'll remember that in a minute. But those um... the, oh the scientific is based on agreement the agreement of scientists. And they're all, this is the thing, they're all based on certain methods. That's something that really wasn't talked that much about in the video. They're based on methods and what's the outcome of the method? Uh, what's the object, the method and the outcome? And the object of the scientific is some natural phenomenon. Uh, the method is observation, testing and controlled circumstance. And then some agreement, it's, it ends in agreement about some understanding of the phenomenon. For the f f philosophical, uh, it, the object is personal experience and the method is uh, reflection and discussion like we're doing here. 
And the outcome is mutual respect. It's not agreement. We don't have to agree. Uh, the revelation, I think, is, uh, you know, the un ultimate answers to ultimate questions or how to live your life. Uh, the method is, again, the revelation in that you are told and the outcome is belief or acceptance. Uh, it also it is conformity, it's, which is also another type of agreement. Uh, mutual respect is also some type of agreement. You agree to respect each other mutually. Uh, but those are, I think they're very, the method and the outcome of these are very different. And the, um, I think what he's looking for in the scientific is that there's, uh, the scientific method it cannot be viewed alone. It is based on agreement of natural phenomenon, but then uh, each, we all need to reflect, we all should be reflecting uh, on the consequences of this in our own personal lives. So personal experience, a bit more of a philosophical uh, consideration. Uh, let, let me comment on that. It, it's a very profound point, the, the point about these parallels between you know, these three methods, the religion, philosophy, and science. Um, partly it is that it's a growth. You, know, you have you know, religion kind of is appealing to faith stories, which is like full of kind of mythos, full of like, it's the kind of oral culture being transmitted into um, kind of this visceral experience of what should be. When you compare that to philosophy, philosophy is explicit use of words to reason about things. Science goes the next step of kind of measurement. It, yes, it kind of starts by, it, you know, it's mostly focused on the external world, but it's the measurement and kind of very careful measurement testing is what is being added. Uh, to that. So it's like there is an increasing scale of precision. Um, the, it is going from kind of whole, just focusing on the whole itself, to parts, kind of dividing into small parts and looking at it and trying to put it back together. Um, so there is a whole part focus, which is different. The faculties involved are also different. Uh, so mm -hmm religion appeals mostly to kind of intuition and feeling uh, to, to keep it going. And then you've got, um, you got philosophy kind of in the middle. And then you have got science, which is kind of, you know, rational sensory measurements and infer, you know, reason inference for, from it. Uh, so I, I really love the, the kind of distinctions between methods. And I think they have different ethos as well. You know, what is going on in the mind? You know, it's like the, the sensibilities are different. What is going on in the minds of each of these people are different. Um, and, the, and the results are also different. And they are all kind of moving targets. Religions keep on moving. Philosophy keeps on moving. And science also keeps on moving. And they kind of interact with each other. They are not separate. They build off. Uh, work off each other. There are these kind of, you know, intermeshing. And then if you, um, so this fantastic point, please, please go on. The, um, well, no, that, again, kind of to follow up on your, the, the point you were just making, there's also a, a context or a structure, the hierarchical knowledge that was flagged by Bronowski would fit more into the religious, the, um, philosophical might be people tend to present it as more individual pursuit and then the scientific i think is a community pursuit it tends to be more of a community but a more democratic um the uh, i was really fascinated by the uh what was said about the constitution and checks and balances. Uh, sorry sorry uh brian i have to I, that that's a fantastic point of pointing out that the scientific is democratic that it is out there for everybody to interact philosophers you know kind of would say okay this is my philosophy and this is it and then there is some discussion but for scientists that's kind of part of the process itself of saying that i'm going to 
to publish my findings and everybody is going to comment on it and we're going to do that do that together so wonderful thank you go ahead and another um that you added i thought was very useful the uh the political process that's established through uh the constitution it includes uh the, the note i have here is that there's some reflection before action so the outcome of the politics is tends, I think, is probably communal action, actions that could not be taken by the individual or uh, setting up frameworks that could not be set up by the individual. It's action, and the uh, the outcome of a sci of science is some agreement on natural phenomena. But again, there's a reflective process built in there through peer review, uh, philosophy, and uh, involves some reflection. I don't know about the reflection in the religious. I haven't thought about that at all. Uh, the, the social and the solitary, I think there's a, there's a, a union of those and there's a full individual fulfillment. Well, there are conditions for success or happiness and fulfillment, and those tend to be the social. And then there's the success, the way we tend to perceive it is success, happiness, and the rest are individual. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's how we tend to think about it. And I think there's a union of the two, and that is that the, um, an active kind of a dynamic union in that people can fulfill their happiness or sense of thriving or pur purpose by creating the conditions for other people to achieve their success. So there's a real, if you're not giving something to other people, uh, they're not gonna want it, they're not gonna take it, and you're not gonna be happy. Uh, everybody's, all, all these examples you give are of one person, even with the skills, one person uh, perfecting a skill, specializing, perfecting, a skill, mastering a skill and providing a service to others. And that's, so the solitary and the social are, I think are unified in that way. Uh, let, let, let me build on this. This is, this is actually really fascinating. I, I want to raise this as a question for anybody because I see these meetups. I think about the social solitary all the time. And I'm saying, okay, what, how do we need to do this? How do we need to run this meetup? How do I need to run this meetup? So that the social solitary is maximized. So each person should be able to think on their own and express their thoughts. And everybody should be able to leverage the fact that so many great people are here. And what kind of rules, what kind of procedures are needed to kind of maximize it? Okay, so the rules that I have of saying, raise your hand so it's, there is no interruptions, uh, keep on topic, you know, just keep focused on the topic because if all of us are focused on the same thing, all our interaction builds on each other. So each of us are individually thinking about it. And if you're talking about the same thing as opposed to other things, then you can leverage the socialness dramatically be brief so that simply because there are limits of time so we can get so many more things and then you know be courteous understand that actually the disagreements are not as important as the fact that you are have the opportunity of sharing and learning about other people's context. And that is precious. Evaluation that you form as a result of that. See, each person is bringing actually different facts that they know. They are bringing their own method of processing those facts. That is actually a much greater value to you than the conclusions. Conclusions sit, your conclusions sit on the top of your facts and your process. They sit on the top. And what happens in most social interaction is that people just 
interact at the, evolu uh, at the evaluation level, missing out the, the, the foundations. And that is what we are able to share. So, uh, so this is something that I really, I, I like to think about of saying, how do we do that? Uh, so, so thank you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Brian, please. Um, I think at the end, he was trying to answer the question of um, this last point you made, you made, uh, you know, setting up the meeting for today. So the hook you used was that there's some final sixth point, and it's the individual's role or purpose. Uh, I forget the last word you used, but the role of the individual. And uh, I think what he pr proposed was that at the end, each must have confidence in his or her own skill and integrity. Uh, and those are, that's fine, but I would, I think I would choose a different word. I would say destiny in that people are born, that people are born into a certain circumstance and then through trial and error, some of which they might view as mistake in retrospect, they find they're in a certain place and, uh, then they're challenged, uh, you know, to uh, bring to do something for the benefit of others, and that's destiny. I, th I think, yeah, it's skill and integrity, opportunity, but it's also destiny, and embracing that that destiny. That, that's a very powerful word. Can you say a little bit more about destiny? What do you mean by destiny? Well, just accepting where you're at and uh, who you are and where you're at and uh, seizing the opportunities that are available there to be of service to others. Wonderful, wonderful, Be beautifully put. But in, and I'll give you an analogy for that. It's like we've used a lot of analogies. It's like being a plant and you your plant you know you're you're a seed let's say that's blown to some sh somewhere and you bloom so you're blooming there and then you, you put out your flower and you feed the bees and the birds and then that episode in your life let's say that you know when you will that's at the end of that episode in your life you're going to send out more seeds and you're going to bloom somewhere else again well that's your destiny to bloom in another place. And you'll just keep blooming in all these different transformations throughout your life. Wow, oh, beautifully put. Thank you, Brian. Uh, anybody else who has not shared would like to share? Uh, Brian Allenby, uh, let's see, anybody else? Kevin, uh, Mike, Patricia, Mike. Mike, this is a, this is, let, let's try this. This is a long format. So you can make your points and I'm going to keep responding to them. So we may be able to have a good conversation. Go ahead, Mike. We always have a good conversation. Uh, tying this to a lot of things that uh, you've talked about in uh, previous things, Plato's comment of what you see depends on his, on your point of view. Uh, Nietzsche's comment of anything that uh, uh, doesn't kill you makes you stronger or weaker, depending on your point of view. Um, the um, progress, civilization's progress, and uh, Bronowski says that in, uh, in, more in the book than in the, um, in, in the documentary, uh, that uh, the role of war made things happen for him. Uh, it gave him a sense of urgency. It gave him a sense of playfulness. Uh, probably the only friend he ever had in his life was Johnny Von Neumann. And uh, those two would not have met uh, uh, if not for war. He was uh, uh, Bronowski before the war was a mathematician who tried to get the mathematic symmetry of uh, poetry. Um, uh, von Neumann was uh, uh, invented lattice theory. Uh, had he uh, not uh, had not been for the war, game theory, which is a childish 
uh, name for uh, for statistical decision theory. Um, it, it would not have it would not have been called game theory, and probably would not have been invented. Um, Mike, Mike, let, let me do one thing. I, I want to yeah. point out the kind of the culture of these folks, uh, Brunowski and Johnny von Neumann. Uh, the best example I have, and I want to connect it to um, Brunowski's concept of democracy of intellect. One of the most favorite, you know, I, I love, uh, surely you're jo joking, uh, Mr. Feynman. And one of my favorite stories from that is the story of Compton Committee, okay? Which just epitomizes for me, the idea of democracy of intellect. They were trying to solve, this was a, Feynman was a young, young guy and he was, one of his first meetings was, he walked in and there were like this 20 odd Nobel laureates, you know, just these eminent figures in science. And they were working on some, the question on the table was a very complex question of a particular kind of enrichment um, of uranium. And Compton was com conducting the meeting. And what they did was that they just went around the table. One person said something. The second person said something completely different. The third person said something completely different. And they just went on. Nobody was actually trying to address one another. They were just stating what they thought was the way of approaching the problem. And after everybody went around the table, Compton stood up and said, it looks like Mr. So-and-so has the best answer. Everybody nodded and the meeting was over, okay? That, and, and Feynman's evaluation of that was, these were great minds indeed. Okay, so that kind of a process of just this commitment to reality having your own views, listening very carefully to what other people are saying, and without any hesitation or compunction, saying that person is right. Not, and forgetting about what you said, because that person is right. Um, I think that captures the spirit of, of these folks. Um, go ahead, Mike. Okay, that meeting would not have occurred, if, and um, and Feynman would have probably gotten a, had an academic career, um, and Enrico Fermi would probably still be in Italy, if not for World War II, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and we wouldn't have had the atomic age, we wouldn't have had the transistor, we wouldn't have had radar, and we wouldn't have had TV. Uh, and we wouldn't have had um, the uh, uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, vaccine because the, uh, the, the mapping of the human genome was not done by NIH and a bunch of doctors. It was done by the Atomic Energy Commission because, and funded by the Atomic Energy Commission. So, uh, Mike. Uh, Mike, what, what, what did you get from this episode or the conversation? Well, uh, the equivalent of the book uh, in the episode is he uh, said Genghis Khan was a nomad and the inventor of a powerful war machine. He, did, uh, he didn't, uh, the BBC uh, softened that a little bit. Uh, so uh, it, uh, uh, that's basically what I got, what you see depends on uh, your point of view from mm -hmm. Plato's allegory of the cave and anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger and civilization um, whether it's the uh, whether it's uh, not getting eaten by a tiger or a robin defending its uh, nest uh, comes by, uh, hardship has a, has a good side to it and that's what what uh, that's what I got out of this. And uh, the best is yet to come. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Kevin or Patricia or uh, Brian uh, Allenby, would you like to give your comments? All right. 
last chance going going gone all right uh folks this has been amazing and i think this format works very well and i might uh i might try this uh zach are you there yeah i'm here uh zach what do you think of the conversation afterwards i thought it was great i mean i think i think uh like everybody was able to kind of engage in like a deep conversation. Like it didn't feel, I don't know. I, it didn't feel like anybody was like getting cut off or like, yeah, like we were able to flesh out the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was nice. It, it, I, and I don't know. I also felt like there wasn't a, you know, like a, time crunch but i thought everybody was being like really courteous with you know keeping responses you know somewhat to the point and yeah i think it i think it worked really well excellent i i thought this was a great meetup uh zach i, th I thought uh, yeah. you know i thought we did a good job uh of first mapping the whole thing out I, th I think we managed to cover kind of the critical themes and i love talking to you so it's just it's uh it's wonderful so thank you thank you very much likewise and uh, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I just want to tell you about the meetups coming up this weekend. I've not announced all of them yet. Um, on Saturday, we are doing a meetup on a really interesting topic, how internet is changing patterns of thought and action in individuals in society. And that's going to be at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. At five o'clock Eastern time on Sunday, we are going to do a meetup on overcoming roadblocks for, you know, overcoming your roadblocks. Basically, how do you, you know, all, all the roadblocks that you talk, we're talking about here, people kind of become ossified, people have kind of uh, artificial limits that they use. How do, how do you deal with that? Uh, so uh, that meetup is going to be with uh, Kyle. And then the next one, uh, the, the one on Saturday is by Samantha. So uh, it's going to be kind of mostly conversations and then everybody will get to share their, their thoughts. So that's what is coming up on the weekend. All right, folks. So thank you very much. Uh, I just, I really en enjoyed talking to, talking to everybody kind of one-on-one -on -one in depth. I thought that worked pretty well um, and I will, look forward to experimenting with that part of the uh, format and thanks again zach thank you for thank you for you know following up on this and uh thank you for actually watching all the 13 videos <laughs> i i wanted you to i wanted you to watch those videos and if it means that i would do a meetup uh, you know I, I talk to you on your podcast to do that so be it <laughs> I watched it so many times. I have the theme song stuck in my head all week. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Boom, 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 boom. On that note, <laughs> good night, everybody. All right. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Thank you.